So Paul, you've just written an article for us about structural changes being underway in markets for key petrochemical building blocks. What are the key reasons for this? A couple, Will. The first one is changes taking place around us. And by around us, I'd summarise changes in refining, uh, operating rates, changes in supply demand for crude. And then in our own business, things around changes in demographics and therefore actual demand for our products. So if you take those two fairly big sets of changes and they're all happening at the same time, it creates quite a lot of additional complexity compared to what you might call the sort of certainties that we used to have to guide us in the past. Okay. Well, which product groups have been most affected by this? Interestingly, it's been the biggest ones, the petrochemical building blocks. So it's ethylene, propylene, benzene and paraxylene together with butadiene. So really what we're seeing is not just one subset of products, but almost every chemical product which is derived from these, whether you're a buyer or a seller, this is going, these changes are going to have some impact and are indeed already having an impact, in some cases quite severe. And what kind of strategies can petrochemical players adopt to cope with these changes? Well, if we look at the kind of changes that are taking place, well, what we see is that in refining, for example, operating rates for refineries are very much lower than they were. In the States, this is because people are using more ethanol and gasoline. In Europe, it's because we're seeing less demand for gasoline. So, by definition, therefore, less gasoline, lower refining operating rates means lower naphtha and liquids coming into the feedstock as for petrochemicals. Then we look at crude oil and the Middle East. We, we have in Saudi Arabia capacity for 12 million barrels a day of crude oil, but Saudi, because there isn't demand for that crude, is only running at about two-thirds of that capacity. So only two-thirds of the ethane because the ethane is associated with that oil production, only two-thirds of that ethane is available. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the West, we've got a big change taking place because of refineries and gasoline changes. In the Middle East, we've got one because we've got a slower economy. And of course, in Asia, we've got disruption going on because China is increasing its output. Ethylene production this year by Sinopec up 40% over last year. Now, demand hasn't increased by that amount, therefore, other players in Asia, particularly Northeast Asia, are having to cut back in order to rebalance. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of changes that are really taking place mm -hmm. and they're affecting therefore ethylene which is coming, really becoming quite long relative to uh, where it's been in the past. Propylene, which when I started was frankly almost a byproduct. It was selling at 60% of the ethylene price, is now selling above ethylene. Yeah. in many markets. Benzene, which was a giveaway kind of product and you could always rebalance by using hydrodealkylation, now that's getting tighter because it's really dependent on other supply, sources of supply. And so if demand goes low, it goes very long and the spreads are increasingly volatile. And then my old um, favourite, paraxylene, I used to buy a quarter of a million tonnes for ICI when we were setting up that business in the 80s. And it was difficult to do it. And I'm not just saying that to say how clever I was. It was difficult because we had to bid the xylene away from the gasoline market mm -hmm. and the refiners didn't want us to have it because they didn't want to risk losing that gasoline molecule and that octane market if somebody was going to draw up at a gas station and want some gasoline. Yeah. Today, no gasoline demand, no octane demand. So suddenly xylene and paraxylene become longer again and less volatile. So all of those major products have really reversed themselves in terms of supply demand balances. And it's all happening in the space of, you know, a, a sort of a few months really. And what, what, what can petrochemical producers do to try and adapt to these uh, volatile times? I think what, the only way we can move forward is to go back to the tools that work well for us in the days when there was volatility before and I'm meaning there particularly the 1970s. Um, Shell in particular uh, pioneered the idea and popularised the concept of scenario planning. So you have a base case and then you have an upside case if things went particularly well and a downside case if things didn't go so well. And I think that's a very good way. If you're not in control of what's happening, 
and we're not. You know, just to take Europe and uh, ethylene and benzene, for example, gasoline de demand and supply in, uh, in Europe is about 160 million tonnes, compared to 20 million tonnes or so for ethylene, compared to 10 million tonnes or so for benzene. So really, a small change upstream on refining has a magnified effect on us. Mm -hmm. One other area that we haven't talked about particularly, but I think it's going to become increasingly important, is the demographics, the ageing of the baby boom generation. Yeah. Those of us who were born after the war, we saw in the UK, for example, 900,000 births a year for 20 years, up from 730,000 pre-war, and then we came back down to that 730, 750,000. So as we baby boomers moved through the 80s and the 90s, and we reached our mid-20s, our 30s and our 40s, so we consumed a lot because we were marrying, we were settling down, we were buying houses, we were having children, peak consumption years. Now we're all moving into our late 50s. We don't need all these things anymore. So again, this is something that's happening to us in petrochemicals. We're not in control of it. And we have to sit back and we say, well, how might these demographic changes play out, particularly in the context of the macro changes I was talking about in terms of refining operating rates, crude oil demand, the rise of China, all these areas where there is legitimately a room for doubt and there is going to be endless debate. Anybody who could come up with the right answer for the next five years and implement it well will make a fortune. For lesser mortals, I think, like ourselves, who take a few best guesses and then see what happens, scenario planning, I think, is the only way to go. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Will.